Hi, I'm Pastor Larry Cole, and you're listening to Torchbearers. Hey guys, I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, today I'm going to talk about places of refuge and places of destruction. Um, we are quickly approaching the very last of the last days. Uh, we are in the last hour of human history, uh, just before the Lord's return. We are at a place that the earth has never been in before. Um, within the next week, week and a half of this recording, the world population is going to be at 8 billion souls alive on the earth. Um, world history is being made right now. Uh, nations are aligning themselves. Things are shifting and moving. Things are rising. Things are falling. And God is getting ready to call his church up to an awakening and to a move that we have never seen in history. What God is about to do, you will not be able to go back in, in books, in films, in documentaries, you will not be able to go back and research what God did in the past that can be compared to what he's doing now. So I'm really excited about the days ahead. I know that right now a lot of people are struggling. Um, a lot of folks, uh, especially in the church, are just feeling weighed down. They're feeling weary. They feel like they've been walking a thousand miles. Uh, in the hot sun without a drink. I'm seeing a lot of people in, in depression, in fear, anxiety. Um, there's a feeling of vulnerability that has just gripped the earth. This is actually the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 60 when it says that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness will cover the peoples, will come upon the peoples. So um, a couple years ago, the Lord revealed to me that we were moving into the time of darkness that would cover the earth. This is the power of hell, and I've spoken about this in previous podcasts, um, so I, I recommend if, if you want to know more, I just don't want to go into it now, but we, we really entered into an era within the last couple years when darkness began to cover the earth. Uh, it kind of coincided with the pandemic, uh, covid um, just things became unsure and there, there's like this blanket of darkness that has covered the earth. It has come with fear, it's come with anxiety, but now we're actually moving into a place where there are soon to be events that are going to happen in the earth that are going to release a greater darkness than what we have seen. And this darkness isn't just going to cover the earth, but it's really going to target the people of the earth. And it's especially going to target the church, especially the carnal church, the church that has its eyes on, on buildings and numbers and money, um, um, ministry names and titles and popularity. Um, the darkness is really going to be able to hit this part of the body of Christ in the earth. And it has to because actually God is allowing that hit of the authoritative darkness because it will then bring his church to a place of repentance. It will bring his church to a place of realizing and recognizing there is something greater. There is something more to this. Um, Christianity is not shallow. If, if you think Christianity is shallow and useless and boring and dull, then you're probably backslid at best and you just need to get your heart right with God. You need to return to your first love. You need to get that fire and that passion burning back in you. The word doesn't speak to you anymore. The worship songs are, are just no different than your, your favorite 80s station or classic rock. But there's a place in the Lord where things begin to come alive, where things begin to breathe, where things begin to move and they begin to live. Um, which brings me to my opening scripture. I want to say this. Christianity is moving if things seem to me to be stale and just parked and, and not moving, again, this is a barometer to measure where I'm at with the Lord, and this is of concern. If, if Christianity seems boring to me right now, and it seems like things just aren't, aren't moving, they're not going, then it's because I'm not in the depths of my Father's heart. So we... 
we have read des descriptions of the throne room of God in heaven. We've heard about people who have been caught up into heaven that have seen uh, the actual throne room. They've heard the thunders. They've seen the lightnings. They have, have just uh, had this, this experience of the vibrations and like earthquakes that come from the throne of God. And even Paul said that he knew a man that was caught up into heaven. And this, this man was unable to even describe the things that he had seen. All right. The Bible also says that we are seated in heavenly places. So we have access in the spirit to these things. And if I'm accessing this, these things, if I'm moving through the veil, if I'm getting in the presence of God, then my spirit is also experiencing at times these same rumblings that are in the throne room of God. I'm experiencing revelation that is just coming out of the throne like shockwaves. It's not just a, a verse jumping out at me from the scripture, but I'm, I'm talking about the deeper depths of the glory of God where, you know, it's kind of like if someone comes up to you and pats you on the shoulder, uh, compare that to revelation, where if someone comes up to you and punches you in the face, that's the glory. That's the difference. There is a place for revelation. I'm, I'm not discounting that. There is a place of revelation. God is revealing things to us. But here's the thing about that revelation. <laughs> if I'm content with the revelation that God gives me and, and I figure that's all that God has for me is um, showing me something that, that's in the scripture, giving me a little bit of understanding. So the time that I'm spending with God, he gives me a little rev revelation. And if I park right there, <clears throat> then I'm not moving on. Sometimes I think the Lord kind of puts revelation in front of us to see if we will be content with that revelation or if we will move on deeper into the Father's heart. So here's the thing about revelation. Revelation is not knowledge. There's a huge difference between revelation and knowledge. Revelation is God himself. And we've got to start looking at revelation like that. When you wake up in the middle of the night just to go to the bathroom and a scripture verse comes to your mind and you suddenly gain this understanding spiritually of that, that verse, friend, in the middle of the night on your way to the bathroom, the Holy Spirit has just revealed something to you. What does the Holy Spirit reveal? He reveals Jesus. So what he's revealing is a man, is God, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. So it's kind of like these, these revelations that he's given us in, in one form, it's kind of like the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And if we are dogs, we are content with that crumb that's on the floor. But it's almost as if the father is putting those crumbs there to let us taste and see how good the Lord is, how good he is to believe how much he loves us, how much he, he's fighting for us. He's defending us, how strong his covenant is with us and how alive he has made us in Jesus Christ so that we would taste of his glory and we would rise up off the floor and see that our father has set a place at his table before our enemies. So this is where God's wanting us to move. He's wanting us to move from, from revelation to revelation, but revelation moves us into glory. And so I can't be content with the revelation because there's so much more. I, I don't just want a, a revelation of a scripture or a little bit of understanding. What I'm looking for is the Father's heart. And the Father loves when we are jealous for Him, when we, we not only don't allow the sinful things of the world to keep us from him. When we not only don't allow depression and fear and shame and guilt keeping us from moving into his presence, but even the revelation that God gives us isn't enough to keep me from moving forward. So when I get revelation, <coughs> I'll take a, a piece of paper and I'll just jot down um, that a couple words to remind me of that revelation and I'll come back to it later so I can keep moving into his presence. So let's read some scripture. Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 26. It says, and he made from one man, Jesus, 
every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So he's not talking about Jesus here. He's talking about uh, Adam. We, we all descended from Adam. And God made boundaries for each of us to walk in, uh, boundaries of geography, uh, boundaries of time. He has put us in places. And it's not that we are restricted in those geographical boundaries, but we are all called to walk in God's purpose and destiny. If God has called you to be in Nebraska and you're living in South Carolina, um, you're out of God's will. So God needs you to be where he has placed you. These are your appointed times and the boundaries of your habitation in, is in the obedience of God. And, and these boundaries aren't restrictive. It's not that we're fenced in. The, these boundaries are actually freedom because that's where we're in pure obedience to the Lord. And that's where the Holy Spirit can really begin to allow us to walk with him. Verse 27, he's done this so that we would seek God. If perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Verse 28, for in him we live, we move, and we have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver, stone, or an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, should change the way that they think, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished yep, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So my, my point of getting into this is if, if your Christianity has become stale, it doesn't seem to be moving. It just seems to be sitting. And, and friends, I'm not talking about activity in the natural. I know like there's a lot of people that are saying, Lord, you know, when are you going to put me in ministry? Uh, when are you going to get things going for me? I'm, I'm not talking about the outward movement. Friend, the outward movement is just a result of the inward movement. So if you're just looking at the things around you and wondering, why does my life seem stale? Why does it seem to be in park or in neutral and just not going anywhere? Friend, life comes from the throne of God. So we're judging our life by what we see in the natural, which means we're judging it the same as the world. God has given us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to know and experience the love of the Father. When I get to that place, that's when I begin to see things really aren't standing as still as I thought they were, but God is moving around me. And in Him, I come alive. I, I live. In Him, I move. There are things that are stirring in my soul. So it's, it's kind of like cranking up, up, up a car. If my soul is the engine, if the engine's not running, then I'm just going to look out the window and I'm going to see the same scenery over and over. And I can't judge the, the vehicle that can move me just by what I'm seeing out the window. If the car's not been cranked up, if it's just sitting in, in a parking lot, then I'm going to get bored. I'm going to think, well, things aren't moving. Things aren't happening. And what God wants to show us is I need you to fire that thing up. I need you to ignite your passion. I need you to get back in my presence. I need you to come to the place where I poured the oil of gladness upon you. And that oil of gladness was an anointing for your call, your purpose, your destiny, your ministry. And when I poured that oil on you, the Holy Spirit came and rested upon you. And you've gotten bored uh, kind of like uh, King David, after he got anointed, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he went back out to the sheepfold. He wasn't king the next day, even though Samuel had prophesied that. So I'm sure when he left the house with that oil still dripping in his hair, I'm sure that for a few days, a few weeks, even a few months, 
sitting out in that pasture with those sheep, life began to get boring. It was exciting at first. Wow, I can't believe Samuel the prophet came to my house. And out of all my brothers, he chose me to be the one that he poured the horn of oil upon my head. And I felt something uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon me and he prophesied over me that I would be king. I'm sure David laid awake many nights under the stars thinking, wow, this is awesome. This is great. And there was this adrenaline rush within him. Same way with us. When, when we hear a good sermon, we get inspired. When we get a prophetic word, we think, wow, this is great. God's speaking to me. God's got a purpose for me. And, and for a few days, even a few weeks, we might look up scripture to, to you know, uh, see how this comes to pass. But then after a few months, when we don't see it, we get discouraged. We get down. And next thing you know, we forget about what that, that word of prophecy was. And a lot of people put that word on a shelf and they say, well, if it's, if it's a true prophecy of God, then it, it'll happen. No, friend, God gave you that word to get you moving. He gave you that word to lead you into his destiny and his purpose for your life. So we've got to crank up the engine. We've got to get the fire going. We've got to ignite our passion for the Lord again so that we can start moving. Why? Again, because... Very soon, we are going to see on the earth that there has been determined places of destruction and places of refuge. Now, what has determined these places of destruction and places of refuge? Well, we can say um, that the destruction is a result of, of God destined this city to be void of his presence. We can say that the wickedness in this city is so great that God can't do anything here and he's moved on. But the reason that places in the earth will be destined for destruction is because there's been a lack of repentance in that place because there have been abominations. And that's the key word that I want to focus on here. There are abominations in places. What are abominations? Abominations are sin that is so wicked and so evil that the Holy Spirit says, I can't dwell here. In the scripture, Daniel chapter 9, uh, also in, in the book of Revelation, we, we read about the abomination of desolation. Uh, Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination, the abomination of desolation, what is the abomination of desolation? It is a sin that is so wicked and so evil that it causes the Holy Spirit to leave and Ichabod is written over the door. If you want to know the ultimate purpose of hell, there, the, the ultimate purpose is to bring abominations onto the earth in geographical locations, in cultures, in people groups, and even in the church. Hell wants to bring abominations to anything and everything so that the presence of God is void. Why would he want to do that? Because hell knows that the earth is about to be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hell knows that where the Holy Spirit does not dwell, that glory cannot be poured out upon the earth. So there are places of destruction that we are going to see in the near future. We're going to see that there are cities that no one has been weeping for, praying for, crying out for. We're going to see that there are regions that no one has been pleading the blood of Jesus and crying out for a harvest of souls. There are places of destruction. There are also places of refuge. How do we make a place of refuge? What is a place of refuge first? A place of refuge is a place where the presence of God is so um, embedded in that home, in that neighborhood, in that region. The presence of God is so embedded, uh, grounded, anchored in that place that it is a wall of protection for the people of God. Uh, this is similar to what we see with Goshen, the land of Goshen that was in Egypt where the Hebrews lived. 
during the time of the plagues that uh, Moses was releasing upon the land of Egypt, we see that those plagues did not have an effect upon the people of God, the Hebrews. Now, they were in slavery. They were experiencing harsh times, but the plagues were not uh, affecting them. Uh, the last plague being the Passover, when they were told to put the blood over the doors, and the death angel came through all of Egypt. And if the blood was not on the doors, then death came to the firstborn. So those who had the blood upon the door, that was a place of refuge. That was a place where the death angel did not strike and the firstborn was able to live. And we know uh, the next day all of Israel walked out of Egypt. So God is looking to make places of refuge. So how do we create a place of refuge? So the Lord has given me the pattern of the tabernacle of Moses to see what things create a place of refuge. So let me say first, I know that there's a lot of people who are preppers, we call them, and they are preparing for hard times. They're storing up food. They're finding ways to um, have water, uh, first aid. Some people are even um, buying guns and ammunition. They're moving out in the middle of nowhere. Um, some people have even moved into caves and, and they're, they're going to hide out until Jesus comes back. Friend, that's not your purpose. God did not call you to hide. I speak to you now as the Lord spoke to Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing here? I did not call you to be here. I called you to confront the darkness that has come upon Israel. I've called you to set my people free. I've given you a word of liberation and I've called you to speak that word and I want to anoint that word and I need you to be raised up and let people know that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has come to set the captives free. He has not called you to disappear in the backwoods and not be seen. He's not called you to shut your doors and lock it and be afraid of whoever would, would come during hard times. <coughs> the Lord has called us to be His witnesses, to be His representatives. This is the gospel. This is the Great Commission. And if I'm hiding out and I'm not moving forward, I'm not fulfilling that purpose that God's called me to. All right. So the characteristics of the places of refuge. Number one is His presence. And I say number one because that has to be priority. My priority for my soul, for my family, for my home has to be the presence of God. It's not about going to a conference. It's not about going to a revival. It's not about attending a church service. It first has to be knowing that God has given us access to his glory and he wants that glory to dwell within us. He wants his presence to be embedded within our souls, within our minds and our hearts. He wants us to be feeding on him daily, eating his flesh, drinking his blood so that we have a place in him because in him we live, we are alive. The death angel passes over when the rest of the world around me is suffering destruction. If I am in him, guess what? I'm living. I'm alive. I can't be taken out. It's just like when the, the disciples were, were crossing the sea and the, the storm kicked up the waves and the wind and the boat was taken on water and they were so afraid. And what, how was Jesus able to stay so calm? Because he was in the Father and the Father was in him. And in him, Jesus was alive. And there was nothing that could happen. Man, even if Jesus had drowned that night, he would have walked on the, on the floor of that sea until he came out on the other side and he would have just wrung his clothes out and kept going, casting demons out of, out of people and healing people and doing the ministry. We've got to experience the world through these same eyes, through the glasses of the glory of God in him get in him this is the word of the lord if you don't hear anything else i'm saying in this get in him whatever you have to do god is not denying you his presence he's calling you into his presence because he knows that once you get there everything that is attached to you that would bring death that would rob you that would plunder you all these things are gone in his presence 
There is no darkness, so any darkness that is resting upon you cannot come into his presence. It's time that we get desperate, that we cry out to God. It's time that we take heaven violently and come into the presence of the Lord. So how do I make a place of refuge? It begins in my soul and then it moves out from there into my marriage, my family, my home, my neighborhood, my church, my region, and even the nations. What do we need for a place of refuge? The presence of God. The scripture talks about there being nations that will be divided as sheep nations and goat nations. What determines the sheep nations from the goat nations? His presence. Where his presence is void, there are goat nations, but where there is a nation crying out to God, there is a sheep nation. So number one place of refuge is his presence. Number two, there has to be a sacrifice. You say, well, wait a minute, a sacrifice, but Je Jesus was the sacrifice and we don't sacrifice anymore. Well, there's two parts to this. The first sacrifice is his. There has to be a constant reminder set before us always of the cross of his suffering, of his death, because in that the covenant was made. In his suffering, God made a covenant that will keep us and hold us till the end of time, actually forever. Part two of the sacrifice is us. What do you mean us sacrifice? Romans 12, one says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. When I begin to live a life of presenting my body as a living sacrifice unto God. A lot of people say, well, I would die for Jesus. I, I wouldn't mind being a martyr. If someone said, deny your faith or we're going to kill you, um, I, I won't do it. And I would love to die for Jesus. But some of these same people have an issue with living for Jesus. It's not about dying for him. It's about living for him. He needs representatives for him on this earth. So when I become a living sacrifice, I become acceptable to God. So we see in scripture where, where in Israel, they would sacrifice unto God. They would sacrifice an animal unto God. And the scripture would say it was accepted by God. I have accepted your sacrifice. Therefore, I will show you mercy. Therefore, my presence is with you. Therefore, I will go into the battle before you and defeat your enemies before you even get there. When we become a living sacrifice, we enter into that same covenant where God says, I see your sacrifice and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to defend you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to bring healing. I'm going to bring restoration. God does this for us. How do I know I'm being a living sacrifice? Because I'm living holy. If I'm busy being a living sacrifice for the Lord, I don't have time for unrighteousness. I don't have time for sin, time for evil, time for wickedness. People who are a living sacrifice for the Lord, they're living a holy life. And the scripture says this is our reasonable service, meaning if you know what Jesus did for you, then you will know what it means to live a, a holy sacrificial life for him. So number one thing that is the characteristics of a place of refuge is his presence. Number two is the sacrifice. Number three is consecration. Number three means I'm, I'm consecration means I'm separating myself from the things of this world. I'm not entertaining um, certain television shows, uh, even good shows, but they are culturally immoral. Um, it is, it is, maybe shows that are exalting the flesh, exalting people's natural gifts and talents. And these are, are cool to watch. I understand that. But there's a place where God is trying to get us to see that he is our God, that he has given us gifts and callings, not just natural talents. There's a place of consecration. Consecration is separating ourselves from the things of the world. I'm going to move on quickly. Number two, the living word. In a place of refuge, the word has come alive. Uh, one example of this is when David finally became king. I love this. His priority was the presence of God. His first um, call 
His first desire was to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem because King Saul was so carnal and, and focused on notoriety and publicity that he had neglected the Ark of the Covenant. He had neglected the presence and the glory of God. And that was David's first purpose, was to bring that glory back. And then we've got communion. What is communion? It's koinonia. It's the deepest fellowship and interacting with the Word of God and with the Spirit of God. And then there's worship, the burning of incense, burnt by the same coals that were on the, the altar for the sacrifice, the same coals that burned hot in your heart for the love of Jesus, for the passion that we're supposed to have for Him. This is the same fire that burns the incense of our worship unto the Lord. And this worship is making a place of refuge. So there's got to be fire. There's got to be passion. There's got to be a first love continuing for Jesus. If your fire is not burning hotter than it was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, friend, you, you're, you're probably backslid. Return to your first love. Cry out to God. Ask him to reignite that fire within you. The next characteristics is, is the glory, the glory of God. Everywhere that Israel was kept and there was a place of refuge, the glory of God was there. The glory of God was present. Well, where is this glory? Well, the scripture says, go look in the mirror. <clears throat> you want to see the glory of God? Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. Paul said, look in the mirror. The glory is within you. Stand in front of that mirror and look yourself in the eyes and cry out to God until you see that glory in your eyes. Without the glory, there is no place of refuge. And God has put his Holy Spirit within us. And he's the spirit of power, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of resurrection. But he's also the spirit of the glory of God. And if you are born again and he dwells within you, the glory is within you. And then last characteristics of the places of refuge there's a priest everywhere there's a place of refuge there is a priest there is someone that's ministering unto the lord ministering unto him on behalf of the people there is someone that's releasing the blood of of jesus christ over the, the region over the people that they're praying for and there's also a blessing that's being released from them so the four characteristics of the priesthood are they minister unto the Lord, they minister unto the Lord on behalf of the people, they are releasing the blood of Jesus through repentance and through pleading of the blood, and then last, they are declaring the blessing. They're not telling God what's wrong with everything, what's wrong with their town, their region, their nation, with the people, but instead they are declaring the purposes of God over those people, over those places. This will make a place of refuge for the last days. So I thank you for joining me. I love you. Let me know if there's anything I can do for you. And until next time, this is Pastor Larry Cole with Torchbearers.